Uh, I don't have a whole lot of time. So basically what I wanted to do with this was provide an overview of a lot of the types of problems or the things that I've been thinking about for a few years now uh, that all sort of lie under the umbrella of localized pattern formation on, on graphs. So the general setting for this is going to be these, these spatially discrete reaction diffusion equations. So your index set uh, lambda, you can think of that as describing, um, you know, spatial locations or uh, you know, vertices on a graph, and the topology uh, or the connections on that graph are going to be given by this graph Laplacian operator. It's going to tell you which vertices are connected to which other vertices, uh, and this forms your sort of underlying space. And Sitting out front here, uh, you have this parameter of the system D that's gonna be your interaction strength, or I'll refer to it as a, a coupling parameter. Um, it's gonna be non-negative. It's really just gonna describe how much of an influence uh, neighboring nodes have on other nodes or have on, have on the current node. And tacked on the end here, the, the reaction kinetics, they're going to be assumed to be bistable. So I have a caricature of a, a bifurcation diagram for a bistable reaction function. Uh, you, can, you can alter this, you can consider all kinds of different ones, but I think this gets the point across. And so the idea here is that um, you've got one stable state, which will re I'll refer to it as the trivial state, it'll probably be u equal to zero in most cases, that's given in dark blue. Uh, and then you've got another state uh, in red that's also stable. I'll refer to it as the activated state, just to distinguish these. And you can see that these are separated by an unstable state. Uh, that's the dotted uh, or the, the dotted red line in the middle there. And everything that I'm going to talk about today uh, is actually going to be steady state solutions. So we can get rid of that uh, time derivative on the left hand side. Uh, and this leaves us with essentially uh, a nonlinear algebraic. Uh, system of equations that need to be solved. And I want to emphasize uh, that all of the work that I'm going to talk about today, uh, all of the results, all of the proofs, everything has been done in uh, collaboration with Bjorn Sanchdata, uh, who I believe is in the audience right now. So the first place that we started with this uh, was that we decided to look at a fairly simple scenario, and that's of uh, one-dimensional chains. So here, your, your vertex set is given by the integer lattice, and you've got these symmetric nearest neighbor uh, contributions from your, your coupling topology. And in this case, you get these really interesting spatially localized states. So um, inside of some compact connected set of the, the integers, um, you get these localized states that have an activated portion on this little compact set. And then outside of it, uh, it pretty much resembles the trivial stable state. And what's really nice about these is when you start continuing them in the bifurcation parameter mu, they trace out these nicely organized, uh, what are referred to as snaking bifurcation diagrams. So you can see these on the board, the red and blue curves. Uh, you can see that they bounce back and forth between two fixed values of mu. And all the while, you have this almost monotonic ascension in the L2 norm, which just comes from the fact that as you round these fold bifurcations, you're just increasing the region of localization, the region of activation in the middle. And you, there's also two of these curves. They're really just distinguished by whether or not you have an even or an odd number of activated nodes in the middle. And then these two curves are connected by the uh, so-called ladder states. That's the green dotted lines. These are the asymmetric solutions. So they come in pairs and they bifurcate in symmetry breaking bifurcations near the extremities of these snaking curves. Okay, so the nice thing about the model you see at the top of the board is that it's really uh, just a delayed difference equation. So if you recast this appropriately, you have a nice spatial dynamics perspective here where you're really looking for solutions uh, to this uh, two-dimensional mapping. And in fact, uh, these particular solutions manifest themselves as homoclinic orbits to this mapping. And so with this perspective, uh, we were able to you know, prove the existence of these things and prove exactly why uh, they lead to these snaking bifurcations. And this really sort of follows what's been done with PDEs for a while. 
But when we were working on this, we started asking ourselves, um, you know, what, what happens if you start looking at more complicated lattice structures? So the first way that we decided to complicate things slightly was to just increase the dimension of the lattice, right? So we, we scaled ourselves up to a, a two-dimensional lattice and we again considered these nearest neighbor interactions. So in this case, it's up, down, left, and right. Uh, but the first thing that you can see from this, this equation is now you can't really interpret it as some sort of spatial dynamical system. This isn't really just a proper uh, uh, mapping or a uh, uh, stepping system in, in just one variable. But you can still find localized structures nonetheless. And these, in this case, we were interested in these localized square patterns. And you can see the resulting bifurcation diagram that they trace out shown on the board here. So the first thing that we notice is uh, it looks almost nothing like the regular pattern or the regular curves I showed you on the previous slide. Uh, these are very disorganized, they're very complicated, and in fact, they're, they're quite unpredictable. But there is something exciting about this. And what really excited us when we looked at this was how much they look like the bifurcation curves that have been traced out by localized hexagon patches in the swift holmberg equation. Now, these bifurcation curves were traced down uh, in a paper about 13 or so years ago. And unfortunately, we still don't have much of an analytical understanding for what exactly is driving these uh, very complicated bifurcation curves. And so, you know, even with the difficulties of this 2D lattice, we still thought that maybe this might be able to shed some light on what's going on with those, those hexagons. And, and, you know, maybe we, we have a slightly simpler system where we can get some definitive results to help us uh, better understand maybe more realistic systems uh, where pattern formation is, is much more important. And so the lack of, of spatial dynamics uh, caused us to turn to another or an alternative method for getting some results in this system. And what we decided to do was completely drop out the coupling altogether. So we set uh, the parameter D equal to zero. And what you get now is a completely decoupled system where you can really just choose which uh, elements are activated and which ones aren't. You can make your own structures. And then what we did is we slowly perturbed the coupling in using, say, the implicit function theorem or near the bifurcation points, you need Lyapunov-Schmidt reduction. And you can ask yourself how these bifurcation curves sort of attach to each other and, and form at, in the weak coupling limit. And we were able to show that actually these localized square patterns lead to a very regular snaking structure, a lot like what we saw with the one-dimensional system, where you sort of just bounce back and forth between two fixed values of mu, and then you get this ascension, which we were able to completely describe using this, this naming convention of ordered pairs on the board, where you sort of just ascend this thing in a lexicographic ordering. But I can almost hear what people are thinking, uh, and they're they're thinking this makes no sense, right? Jason, you just told me on the previous slide uh, things are extremely complicated, unpredictable, and now you you just told me that you proved that they're not, right? They're they're very predictable. And you know, one possible explanation that you might have to to square this circle would be that as you increase the coupling parameter, these things become, you know, more nonlinear. They become, uh, you know, they deform a little bit, but nonetheless, the topology stays the same. Uh, but unfortunately, this is incorrect. And in fact, uh, we've known this for a little while. This goes back to a, a 2010 paper by Taylor and Dawes, which they uh, numerically explored this, this similar system. And they found and documented what they termed switchbacks. So the general idea here is that when the coupling is very, very small, you get that regular snaking curve that I showed you on the previous slide. And it's shown to you on the left-hand image in light gray in the background. But of course, you know these aren't the only localized structures that exist in this system. There are tons more, and some of them lie on isolas, which are closed curves in the bifurcation diagram. So one example is given on the left, that figure eight blue curve. And what happens is that as you increase the coupling value, 
some of these isolas collide and they attach to the snaking curve, essentially rewriting the whole curve. And that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side, where if you wanted to follow your old snaking curve, now you have to traverse the entire isola before getting back on track. And what we were able to show uh, with, with some nice numerics was that we expect infinitely many of these switchbacks to occur. We in fact know where they, they are incurring on the bifurcation branch. And uh, we found that these infinitely many should be exponentially localized in the coupling parameter. And so the effect here is that, you know, if you're slowly increasing the coupling coefficient, you have a nice regularized structure for very small values. And then, you know, almost all at once, this whole curve basically rewrites itself through the, all of these switchbacks and gets you into that mess that we saw a couple slides ago. And so this leaves us, uh, you know, this, this helps us to understand that dimension is clearly playing a critical role here, right? The, the difference from one dimension to two dimension is very, very different, at least for larger coupling values. Uh, but what's not completely obvious is that theorem I showed you on the previous slide uh, relies pretty heavily on the fact that we use nearest neighbor coupling. And so this got us thinking a little bit more, you know, what is the effect? What if we start changing up the coupling, right? And this is where we, we've started turning to more recently. Uh, we scaled back the system that we were going to investigate. In this case, we turned to a slightly simpler model. So these are ring networks now. And we want to ask ourselves, what happens as I change the coupling? How does pattern formation, uh, how does it affect it here? And so I'm going to illustrate everything with a, a six element ring, just uh, to be concrete. And in this case, you have three different kinds of coupling. So you've got your usual nearest neighbor, that's connections to the left and right on the ring. Uh, you have an almost all to all coupling. This would be a next nearest neighbor coupling. So two connections to the right, two connections to the left. And then you've got an all to all coupling. So every element is connected to every other element. And what you can see uh, along the bottom here is that the nonlinear equations that need to be satisfied in order to find these steady patterns, uh, they are equivariant with respect to increasingly larger symmetry groups as you put more connections into this network. And in fact, this has a huge, um, uh, this has a huge effect on the expected bifurcation structures as well. So what we decided to do was take a similar approach to what we did with the 2D lattice, where we drop out the coupling, find what the patterns look like, and then perturb the coupling in to see how these patterns arrange themselves in parameter space. And what we found is that for the, the nearest neighbor or the sparse coupling, you get your usual snaking. So this is, uh, the idea here is that, you know, if you start with a ring with only a single site activated, then as you ascend this snaking bifurcation diagram, uh, you sort of get, you, you slowly start activating around the ring, starting with the two nodes that are closest to your initial activation. But, what happens is that uh, for the almost all to all case, because you have a larger symmetry group, you sort of skip over some of these, these rungs on the, on the snaking curve. And what you can see for the six element ring is that you know, elements two, three, five, and six all bifurcate together, all coming from this extra symmetry. And we don't have a proper explanation for this as, uh, as the size of the ring grows. Unfortunately, this is very specific to a six element ring. And then the, the culmination of all of this is the all to all coupling, uh, where we really see that no matter the size of the ring, you always get a closed curve with six folds on it, no matter what happens. And this really just comes from that all to all coupling, everybody's bifurcating together. Okay, just to close off here, um, I just want to mention some ongoing and future work. So the, the criticism that one might have is that I have looked at very regular lattice and network structures, right? The usual integer lattices and the, the usual ring lattice. So the question is, you know, how do we generalize these results to more complicated graph structures? And the idea that I, I'm hoping to pursue here was actually brought to my attention by Matt Holzer. Um, 
which was to use these graphons. So graphons you can think of as being uh, the limit as the number of vertices go to infinity for an adjacency matrix. And in this formal limit, uh, you arrive at these non-local uh, reaction diffusion equations, as you can see on the board. And so the hope here is maybe we can use these, these non-local equations in order to understand pattern formation for large finite graphs under some appropriate limit and based on the certain properties of graphons. And then finally, uh, we might ask ourselves, you know, what about time dependent localized states? And uh, I'm giving you an example of a system coming from a 2016 paper where again, they were looking at a 1D chain and they found these really interesting localized time periodic states. Uh, they kind of look a, a little bit like my, my solutions from the 1D chain, except that that activation area, you, you can think of as having like synchronized penduli uh, swinging in unison there. And so the question sort of uh, restart here and you, you ask yourself similar things like, you know, can we prove the existence of this? Can we prove uh, what kind of bifurcation structures are, are going to be present based on the connection topologies? And, you know, you have this, this sort of resetting and this multitude of interesting problems to go forward. Okay, so thank you very much.